Hello and welcome back to the Loyal Sun Show. Um, there's only one thing on the uh, forefront of hit fans' minds the world over right now, and that is uh, the the condition of uh, Pitt Panther, Central Catholic Viking, um, you know, loyal son of Pittsburgh, Damar Hamlin, uh, in his condition right now. Uh, on Monday night during a game against the Cincinnati Bengals, as you know, I'm sure you all know right now, uh, DeMar collapsed and had to be revived via CPR where he was taken to a local hospital and, uh, intubated and, uh, and put in a medically induced coma. Um, one of the most harrowing sports events, I think in recent memory or in anyone's memory, uh, definitely as it pertains to football and, uh, Obviously, this one hit pretty close to home. Damar is the ultimate pit man, um, the ultimate man, really, just an incredible guy on and off the field. And uh, it's been a tough couple days for all of us in, in Pittsburgh and beyond. Um, I'm joined by uh, my co-host, John uh, Dillon. How are you guys doing? You know, how we... How we feeling lately? I know it's been a pretty sour couple days. Um, some better news as of recent, but uh, I know we've all been trying to deal with this, and our thoughts and prayers have been with Hamlin and his family and everyone that knows him. Absolutely. It was super scary scene and very emotional. Put a lot of things into perspective, sports fans and just really humans watching that whole situation go down like you mentioned hits really close to home him being a pittsburgh kid he's only a couple years younger than us cross paths with damar plenty of times not close associates by any means but you know cross paths at pitt when we were both students there um au tournaments growing up seeing him play against north hills when he was a central catholic viking yeah um so it it makes things very real when that's someone who is so big in this community i mean everyone in pittsburgh knows damar hamlin he's he shows out uh for the young kids in in high school right now supporting them he stayed at home to play at pitt so it's been a rough few days but um pretty amazing the outpouring support that's come across for damar whether it's been the thousands and millions of tweets showing support for him the millions of dollars that have been contributed to his chasing m's foundation in support and salt of solidarity with damar and just the overall um just the nfl banding together nba giving shout out everyone really across yeah. america right now is rooting for damar and pulling for him praying for him so it's been pretty amazing to see that outpouring of support and was huge weight lifted today when we heard some good news about um and we are recording this around 5 30 on thursday evening so uh hearing the news that he had come to and was squeezing people's hands and actually had asked uh via writing on a pen and pad who who won the game if they won the game on monday night um that was real weight lifted i just know it's been on the front of everyone's yeah. mind so that was uh definitely encouraging news to hear i'm sure there's a, still a long way to go it seems but uh things definitely seem to be trending in the right direction you can only say it a million times but it was it was incredibly scary we've never seen anything like this on a football field before um you know that kind of reaction an ambulance on the field uh gratuitous close-ups of teammates in clearly in shock and in tears. And then, you know, we've had scary injuries in football before Ryan Shazier. Yeah. Kevin Everett for the Buffalo bills. Ke Kevin Everett. I was, um, Tua earlier this year Tua's was, uh, Dane Jackson's earlier this year. It was really scary. And, we, and we've had those, but those never really felt life threatening. I mean, obviously awful and life altering, but you know, there was a, we were fearful for Demar's life. He was clinically 
dead on the field and and resuscitated and and needed assistance breathing and and you know there was a lot of concern about you know if he'd be able to pull through and you know if if he was able to pull through you know what what his standard of living would be from there but you know we're hearing really really positive things neurologically intact is the neurologically intact is is the is the term we were looking for and then we also saw today that he's uh experiencing movement in all of his extremities uh so you know really really promising stuff when just two days ago you know we we feared the worst yeah it's uh promising stuff coming out just continue i think everyone just needs to continue to show support for damar and his family uh super thankful and i don't know if we'll ever be able to give them enough credit but for the bills training staff and Mm -hmm. for the for the medical staff at uc hospital just brilliant work by them and i uh, can't say enough about how important that that fast acting work by uh, those medical professionals was so um shout out to all of them involved yeah i i think we're all super thankful for how you know the trainers and the medical staff at uh the uc hospital handled things uh i think when there's you know tragedies in america we have a tendency because uh, when bad things happen, we get understandably angry. And I, I think we have a tendency to uh, lash out, even in these situations where it's a completely blameless situation. And, you know, we we dump on anyone we can get our hands on. Skip Bayless for his tone deaf tweet. Um, <clears throat> the NFL for their uh, questionable handling of things. Um, anyone who tried to put any blame at the feet of T Higgins or uh, for some reason, the COVID vaccine, you know, we have a tendency to, you know, make these people the story and dump on them. Um, But uh, it was, it was the local hero himself, Mr. Rogers, who would always said, and I always think back to this when something bad or terrible happens is, uh, you know, when, when tragedy strikes, look for the helpers because you'll find them, you know, 5 million people donated to, uh, this toy drive, this local cause that Damar really cared about and, you know, has been propping up since college. There were, you know, trainers and medical staff, like you, Dylan mentioned that, you know, saved his life. It was uh, Denny Kellington, the uh, trainer for Buffalo, who initially uh, performed CPR on him and, and was able to help restart his heart. Um, and and then, you know, the outpouring of of support that we've seen all across the country so you know just a reminder out there when this kind of stuff happens it's it's easy to get angry and make the story about the skip baylesses of the world but there's there's real heroes out there and and people who are you know looking to do right by every bad situation that uh much more deserve our attention yeah it's unfortunate that it takes something like this for it to happen but Given the circumstances, people across the world are now aware of what a great human being Damar Hamlin was. I'm sure across mm-hmm. the NFL, people took notice of his football talent, but now it's on the forefronts. Uh, everything he did off the field, uh, from taking care of the people at McKee's Rocks, I think one of the things that's been going around a lot is how he stayed home to be a role model to his brother and all those genuine things that he did throughout his life off of the field are now uh, front and center. So us Pitt fans were aware of the type of human Damar is. And now this story is being shared. It's inspirational and it's going to help a lot of people in the community and afar. Yeah. I think it's pretty awesome that some of these stories about Damar have got to get spread on, of course, unfortunate circumstances, but I love that people are getting to see like, you know, before he was just number three for the Buffalo Bills for most of the NFL, uh, most of football fans across the country. Now they're like this Demar Hamlin kid from Pittsburgh, the kid from McKee's Rocks who decided to stay home, who gives it back to his community. And I mean, we know as Pitt fans how much he meant to the Pitt program. He was kind of like a turning point, maybe a key. Mm-hmm key point of narduzzi's tenure like he was a he was like his first big recruit right i think all three of us could probably name where we were when he committed i remember i was in the student union eating dinner when 
<laughs> the news was on and we all jumped up whenever he picked the pit hat. Yeah. It, it was mean, a big deal. He was, what was it? that there dude. Was, there was Pitt, Ohio State, and Penn State on the table. And he put on that hat on the local news to say he was staying home. And he was a linchpin for Narduzzi's defense for a few years. I I remember where I was when he was getting his first playing time. It was that Virginia Tech game. Everyone was calling for DeMar to come in. He had been banged up and thought he was going to get redshirted. And finally, Narduzzi threw him out there to play. And the rest was history. He was a he was a captain at Pitt, and he was part of a, a defense which was pretty loaded in 2020 year, a defensive mm-hmm. backfield with mm-hmm. his childhood friend and teammate Paris Ford. That was a huge story at the time. Um, huge. I mean, that was like the two Pittsburgh kids in the backfield, the two safeties, one of the best safety tandems in the country. So there was we knew all about DeMar Hamlin. We he didn't fly under the radar for us. So it it is pretty awesome given the circumstances to see all the football fans across the country get to learn a little bit more about him. And, you know, it, it's pretty cool that, you know, as as he uh, wait, wakes up and regains his faculties, you know, they'll they'll kind of let him know what happened over the last couple of days, piece by piece as to not overwhelm him. And he will slowly but in you know somewhat real time get to see all of the messages of support um all of you know the heartfelt thoughts and and prayers and messages and everything that that went his way all all the support his family has gotten he's gonna wake up and and you know if if he hasn't already find out that his charity that had a twenty five hundred dollar goal is over five million dollars and and you know it's you know not enough people get their flowers while they're alive and we have a tendency to say really nice things you know at at funerals and it's i think it's great that he's gonna get to see the the love and support around him and how appreciated he is both in pittsburgh and beyond absolutely but i think it's important to just keep praying keep continuing mm-hmm. to show support for damar and I think everyone around around the country, around the world, football fans in general should look at this as a time where we all have kind of come together and acknowledge that although this is a game that we are all very passionate about, there those are real people out there. And it's important to kind of learn their stories and understand them and what they came from. And it can make you I'm it can make you appreciate things a little bit more and Mm-hmm. Make, makes these games that maybe don't go in our favor matter a little less and really just appreciate life. I think everyone, I know for myself, I like took a step back on Tuesday after Monday was like during the game, we're scrolling Twitter. We just want to see good news come up. We want to know what, what they're diagnosing. We want to see that, Oh, he's going to be okay. He's given the thumbs up, but that, I mean, this is a slow process that wasn't coming just yet. So on Tuesday, it was good for me, at least, to just take a step back, take a walk and just kind of appreciate the things I have around me and appreciate my health, my family's health, my friend's health and uh, kind of just a quick memory. Don't take anything for granted. And it was tough. This was all tough. And like you said at the beginning of this day, this isn't a typical Loyal Sun segment. But it was important <laughs> to talk about. And uh, I just want to say I love the pit community. I love all the people we've got to meet through doing this. Obviously, I've known you guys for a long time, but love doing this with you. And it was a it was important that we talked about this. And it's important that we all just continue to support each other, lift each other up. Are you or someone you know looking for work in a recession-proof industry? Are you someone that's interested in things like having health care, having a 401k, immediate PTO accrual, an employee assistance program, or referral payouts? Our newest sponsor, Haddad Accelerated Delivery, an Amazon delivery partner, is looking for safety-minded and dependable drivers to join their delivery service team. Be a part of a company that will encourage self-ownership and award bonuses based on exceptional safety and delivery efforts.
This is the ideal gig for individuals seeking full-time work or students interested in making some pretty good money during breaks. If you or someone you know is safety-focused, hardworking, organized, efficient, and team-oriented, text HADD to 464-646 to apply. I understand that that is an impossible string of letters and numbers, so here it is again. That's HADD to 464-646. For a job that's the total package, get it? Because, like, it's uh, deliveries. Hat at Accelerated Delivery is the place for you. So we do want to touch on this past weekend in Pitt Sports. Obviously, Friday, December 30th was a huge day for the Pitt Athletics Department with the victories of the basketball team over the North Carolina Tar Heels, as well as football team over UCLA in the Sun Bowl. We had recorded an episode on Monday prior to the DeMar Hamlin injury. However, uh, we didn't release that, but we do at least want to touch on the events of this past weekend because it was such a big day for Pitt fans and Pitt sports. So, fellas, thoughts? I mean, we, we had a big bad day at Archie. Squid, you and I mm-hmm. both made it into the Pete electric atmosphere um just kick me off let's start with the basketball game go in chronological order here yeah archie's uh absolutely electric the whole day but especially during that basketball game i had forgotten what it was like to watch uh consequential pittsburgh basketball with a group of people every bucket was celebrated like a touchdown uh and and you know the the boys were buzzing. The boys were buzzing. I was a little jealous of you guys at the, at the, uh, at the Pete, but um, we we did it right. Uh, it at at Archie's and it rolled right into, uh, the pit football game. Um, yeah. so we we could probably go go over a million details about the UNC game. Uh, but since then, Pitt has had an even more impressive win. But I think you said we wanted to go in chronological. Well, before we get to that, I'll say this. The Pete was popping. It was one of the more full games. It did not get any less popping whenever he left the Pete and got to Archie's. It was packed at Archie's. It was just as loud for every big player in the football game. If if people weren't there for, you know, Pitt sports, they were there because, you know, they heard rumor in every corner of Western PA that Archie was in his bag cooking up those wings that that first set of wings because you know you had to get multiple uh orders in you know every couple hours uh i think one of the best meals i've ever had in my entire life spicy ranch unbelievable uh go get it if you haven't yeah and archers right. didn't have enough pictures for everybody if you want to try to order a picture they'd tell you if you can find an empty picture we'll fill it for you but it's slim pickings right now the boys they're getting after it <laughs> Power rankings on the day. One, Spicy Ranch Wings. Two, Nick Patty. Three, Jamarius Burton. I think pl- almost play any other day of the year, it would be Jamarius Burton at number one. You can play with those rankings however you want, but that's that's my vote, and I'm sticking to it. The, the AP voters can get mad at me if they'd like. I, I think, obviously, uh, cheap domestic beer belongs somewhere in the rankings, but again, I am... Uh, I'm not given an AP vote for a reason. All right. So let's touch on the Sun Bowl. We we have some more basketball to talk about, but there's going to be a lot of basketball. So let's at least recap the Sun Bowl for what it was. Nick Patty's swan song, just absolutely heroic game-winning drive. Ben Saul's also a hero of the day. He's probably getting some votes as well. He, he should have been in that top five. But just front to back, um, what what did you guys feel watching that Sun Bowl? Because I was told before the game that it was actually meaningless and fans and players didn't care. There were men of all ages. There are there were kids who were freshly 21. There are kids, kids. There were, <laughs> were guys approaching their 30s. There were fathers. There were, we're uncles. Still kids. We're still at kids. Archie's. Whenever Ben Saul's drained that last field goal, everyone was hugging each other. There were chants. Everyone cared. I'll tell you that right now. 
Yeah, because I mean, even if bowl games don't matter, they're fun. And even if your whole defense opts out, it's an opportunity to see your young guys who are going to be stepping up next year, you know, an opportunity to see what they have before the spring game, which is still like 50% effort. Yeah, Ma- Matt Gonsalves tweeted out a picture of him holding the Sun Bowl trophy. He said, this is the greatest sporting event I've ever been a part of. That's a dude who was a part of the ACC championship last year. Ben Sauls and Cam Guest were hugging each other and crying and saying, you know, this is something we've dreamed of. Don't yeah, tell me. Me and, Evan, me and Evan Davis did the same thing. We, we hugged <laughs> each other in tears after that last field goal was made. <laughs> exactly. So don't don't tell me these games don't matter to the kids. I mean, I'm sure there are teams who are completely checked out, tuned out by the time the bowl game rolls around, but there were so many great storylines with this one. I feel like we almost undersold it going into it. I don't think, obviously, with the result and the benefit of hindsight, that Sun Bowl goes down in, in history for Pitt. But even leading up to it, like we said, it's the seven guys who have opted out, and now they get to be replaced by guys who are trying to earn that starting spot next year. It's Nick Patty, one of the most beloved Pitt Panthers, and the mm-hmm. ratio between love – of from fans and games started he might be the leader uh but nick actually i mean it was his last game and those guys were battling for him and it was awesome to see and it was awesome to see him scramble get a first down clock the ball and pick it a game-winning field goal out of it it was it was a magical moment yeah, and by the way, by no way other than the grace of God did he split those two defenders to clear that field goal target line on that fourth down. But uh yeah, yeah, that was that was a thing of beauty. Um can't help but think, you know, if if that kind of leadership and and spunk was missing the entire season, but uh we don't have to do that right now. Yeah, it's not the time for that. We 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 could talk about that for hours, but let's let's enjoy this Sun Bowl victory. Nine and four, which we called, by the way. Oh, we called it months ago. Yeah, you can you can uh line up at the door of Loyal Sun's headquarters uh to deliver your personal apologies when we were doubted for saying they'd be mostly you two. I will give you guys all the credit on that. Mostly you two said that we would go nine and four. Um but I also expect a secondary line to the left of the nine and four doubter apology line. And that is for the Kenny Pickett doubter apology line. Because, oh boy, did our sweet dear boy Kenny Pickett deliver again the following night. Back to back game winning drives. He's put together on national TV in prime time. And the Raiders one was great. Don't get me wrong, but this one in a rivalry game against the Ravens to keep the playoff hopes alive and to make three really, really high level, big time, big moment. This guy has it throws on that drive. The one to Friar Muth, the one to Sims, and then obviously the touchdown to Najee. It, the narrative around Kenny Pickett and the conversation around Kenny Pickett it there's been a big shift since that game a lot of people were like whoa okay we see I did not think we are amongst the leaders of the Kenny Pickett bandwagon back whenever people were calling for his benching after they Mm -hmm. lost to Virginia on opening night we stood firm I did not think that the national media would be uh, speaking this highly yeah and being won over by Kenny Pickett this quickly the local media, they'll be the local media. They'll they'll grumble and groan about every incomplete pass. But mm-hmm. NFL Network was doing like 15-minute segments on how impressed they are of Kenny Pickett. Yeah, you guys are exactly right. The shift in narrative surrounding uh, Kenny in the last two weeks could be registered on a seismograph. I, I mean, think it, the, the crazy part is uh, after his first start, oh, not his first start, his first action, he threw three interceptions and we're like, oh no, this is going to be like the pit days where we're fighting to fend off the haters and tell him, no, 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 it's actually not his fault. Our work is done. 
I, I w- not done yet. Not done yet. I mean, we we still have one the playoffs to make, which is still a possibility. Then the Ridiculous. Bowl, yes. And then two, uh, we need to get that new offensive coordinator in that allows Kenny to um, attempt these throws downfield that he can obviously make that he obviously is capable of uh so that we can it's not as important as, as important as wins and losses but you know at some point i would like the numbers to reflect um the it having that he has as a as a guy who has it uh we'll, we'll get there that's down the list but w- would be good would be good for our argument's sake okay so we could talk about kenny pickett all day but let's save some for after he Leads us to the playoffs. Wins the we Super need, Bowl. We need some more content after the next Steelers win. So let's keep it in the chamber. Simmer down. Hey, Panther Nation. Have you ever crashed your spin scooter going down Cardiac Hill? Or wiped out on an icy sidewalk in South Oakland? Have you ever been hit by a bus crossing Forbes Avenue? Well, you may not have to pay that hospital bill on your own. If you're hurt in an accident, pick up the phone and call Guido at Guerrera Law. Guido Guerrera is a University of Pittsburgh Law School grad, pit football superfan, and experienced personal injury attorney who's licensed in Pennsylvania and Ohio. And it is 100% free to call him for consultation on your personal injury case. So the next time you... Get rear-ended in Oakland rush hour traffic. Or if you fall down the stairs at Peter's, call Guido. All joking aside, Oakland and the world can be a very dangerous place. If you need legal help, talk to Guido. He'll treat you like a fellow Pitt fan and never like a number. 412-229-7757 is the number to call. That's 412 229 Seven seven five seven to call Guido. You can also contact Guerrero Law at GuerreraLaw.com. That's G U R R E R A. Call Guido today. So we already talked some hoops, talk about the UNC game from last Friday, but Pitt has actually followed that up with another ranked win, an even bigger win against the UVA Cavaliers. Uh, me and Squid are going to talk a little bit about that. David had to get r- rolling. He's at dinner with his girlfriend. Yeah, some but, of us only care about podcasting. Yeah, some whatever. of us some of us actually care about podcasts and Pitt basketball, but whatever. Uh, so, Squid, we were there last night. Tuesday night, not last night. Tuesday night, we were there for the win over Virginia, and wow, that was, felt a little improbable, especially at halftime, but that was the biggest win of the capable era. I don't think anyone can argue that. Yeah, beating Virginia is no easy task. I mean, they were ranked number two not that long ago. In the first half, there was a moment where I thought to myself, oh, man, that was fun while it lasted because they couldn't do anything. They couldn't get to the hoop. They couldn't defend. And it's Virginia. They just play that style of basketball that once you're down, you're basically out. Yeah, I we were down seven with about a minute left in that first half. And I was like, if they can get the half down seven with the way they play it, I'll feel pretty good. Uh, McNeely hits the three from the corner. We go in down 10. And that kind of felt like a dagger, an early dagger. But... And then they come out in the second half and we're down 12 with, I believe, maybe 16 minutes left, whatever it might have been. And Mm. 12 against Virginia feels like 20 just with their that mover blocker offense. They're methodical on defense. They are super tough with the pack line defense. And it really didn't feel like Pitt was going to be able to get any type of momentum going. And then all of a sudden they go on a 14-0 run. And guys start hitting shots. Nelly Cummings, really a catalyst of that. Finished the night with eight assists, no turnovers. A um, bunch of guys stepping up. Shout out to Nike Sabande, hitting some big shots for them, 16 points off the bench. Um, it was just a little bit of everyone, everyone who was getting significant minutes. I mean, that second half, Burton, 
Cummings and Henson played all 20 minutes. I think Federico came off the floor at the end when they were shooting free throws, but it was a total team effort. I guess a total team that was actually getting on the court effort. They didn't get very deep on their bench. Yeah. I don't know how much you all listen to the player interviews, but listen to Blake Henson's because they're entertaining, but he's also very insightful. He talks about after the game, how everyone on the team, they think they're the best player on the team, but all they care about is winning. So if Greg Elliott last night, he was one for seven. Blake Hinton said, I did not care. I was passing him the ball and he was shooting. Everyone has that mentality. Whatever it takes, we're going to do it and we're going to win. There were a few times, even against North Carolina, they were down double digits and they were a three away from that being an insurmountable lead. But they dug their heels in and... I, I guess we can expect this now. I think after the Miami game or uh, Miami, the Michigan game, we thought if this team gets down, it's just like all the other cable teams, they'll roll over and give up, but not these guys, this new group, I'm, the veteran leadership is a big part of it, but they're different. I think we can officially say that now. We thought about saying it after the Tennessee Martin game, but I think we can officially say it now. Might have jumped the gun a little bit, but that's actually coming to fruition a little bit. What The flashes we saw in that Tennessee Martin game. But yeah, I, I feel the same way. After the West Virginia and Michigan games, it was like, mm, this is kind of another cable team. They can't stick together, go down. It looked like they had given up in both those games. I would have loved to be on a fly on the wall to hear what Jeff Cable said to them after the Michigan game. Because even though they lost the next game to VCU, there had to be some type of conversation, some type of practice moment that led to these guys saying like, all right, this isn't how this is going to work. And I will say it's promising to see, you know, you don't want to go down double digits, but to have consecutive games where you go down double digits to a ranked opponent and then come back, claw back and win the game. It's been, those two games have been a real testament to what, type of job that Jeff Capel has done with this team this year. I think he's gotten ragged on a lot and deservedly so for his first four years here. But at this point, I think he he deserves some credit to turning this team around, bringing guys that are willing to be coached. I think that's one of the things that he brought up is like they went after guys who really want to be coached. And you can tell that with this group, they're not afraid to get after each other, keep each other accountable. And he can coach these guys hard and it's showing. And I, I think having a bunch of veterans, you know, Nelly, Nike, Jamarius, Greg Elliott, they're all in their last year of eligibility with COVID years, with red shirts, whatever it may be. So these are grown men. These are older guys and they've been around in college. And I think, you know, you have guys who are on their last ride. Their the number one goal is to win. It's not about yeah. what numbers can I get? What accolades can I get? These guys are looking to win and it, and it shows up very clearly. Yeah. I got asked at work the other day, like, why is this pit team better from someone who they like pit, but they don't follow the basketball team all that closely. And I, that's what exactly what I said. It's just a bunch of guys that want to win. I mean, they're at the point these guys aren't going to the NBA, but they want to get to the NCAA tournament. That would be probably just as big for them at this point of their careers. Just making the tournament, having that feeling of playing the first round. I know a few weeks ago, looking ahead of the schedule, we thought we got UNC, Virginia, Clemson, and Duke. Four in a row. I probably you who tweeted it, Dylan. If we can go two and two in that stretch, feel we're good. feeling pretty good. Yeah. Well, we're two and oh. <laughs> Would love to get more than just two out of the stretch now. We got Clemson on Saturday. I mean, that Virginia game was probably the biggest game uh in the Capel era, just because we're coming off of a big win and another win can really solidify you and a loss can take her back down to earth. This Clemson game might be the new biggest game because if they win, I can't imagine them not being ranked. Yeah, I definitely think the Clemson game will be the biggest game of the cable era so far. Uh, the Virginia game was huge. It was his biggest win thus far. But let's be honest, I think some people were still pretty wary of, is this Pitt team really that good? Did they beat a UNC team who was a little overhyped coming into the season? And the Pete wasn't exactly packed on Tuesday night. Now, I'll, I'll give it to Pitt fans. 9 p.m. on a Tuesday. So, first first day back after the new year. That's pretty tough. Students still weren't there, so the zoo wasn't filled. 
But I kind of I sat down. I was like, oh, I thought we'd have a little bit better crowd than this. It's going to be rocking in the Pete on Saturday. You can tell that people around Pittsburgh who have been starving for a good basketball team for how long now they're ready. They're ready for it. And Pittsburgh will rally around the Pitt Panthers. We knew how popular they were when Jamie Dixon and Ben Hallam were here. Um, this this is a city that's ready for a competitive Pitt basketball team. So that place is going to be rocking. And for it to be for first place in the ACC on Saturday, 4 p.m., I mean, it doesn't get much better than this. Oh, boy. Yeah, we were leaving the Pete from the Virginia game, and we just thought to ourselves, oh, they play at home Saturday at 4? Yep, we'll be there. We checked the ticket prices. We're like, all right, we'll get these tomorrow morning. It's already 11 o'clock. Let's get home, get to bed. I wake up the next morning. Most of those tickets I were looking at were gone. Yeah. It... <laughs> People are People... starting to ask if they're back. I'm not saying they're back, and I won't because I feel like I've said it every year for hey. the last four. So I'm not going to say it. But we might make a shirt about it. So just, just be prepared for, for that. Yeah. it It's awesome to be really excited about pit basketball again. Like for a pit basketball game to be viewing appointment. Like I've had several people who I know have not followed pit basketball all that closely the past mm-hmm. few years be like, oh, you're heading down to the game Saturday. What are you doing before the game? Like, I can't wait. Like, there are a lot of people excited again, and it's a great opportunity for Pitt. It really is. The game got moved to ESPN2, so it'll be on national TV. And it feels like there's a little bit of momentum around this program right now. Um, Brandon Cummings, Nellie's younger brother, plays at Lincoln Park High School. He's a junior, and he just committed. Uh, Pitt just picked up their first commitment of the 2024 class. They have two really good guards in Jalen Lowe and Carlton Carrington in the 2023 class, along with Marlon Barnes from Brush High School, uh, John Hughley's alma mater. So there's a little bit of momentum with recruiting. There's momentum with this team right now. And it's a big opportunity Saturday for them to take a step forward. Now, it can't be all sunshine and rainbows. I, I do want to mention... A part of this team that has me a little worried, a little unnerved, and that's all the right, lack. All right. That's the lack of depth. Right now, as it is, Pitts effectively has a six-man rotation. The starters with Nike Sabande, uh, the Diaz Grams each played sparingly in the Virginia game. I want to say, what was it, five and four minutes respectively for Jorge and Guillermo, hmm. and then uh, Nate Santos played two two minutes. So you get 11 minutes out of that those guys. That's maybe like a seventh man in the rotation. But you can tell there's not a seventh guy right now if they're comfortable playing. So it'll be interesting to see if John Hughley can get healthy, back in shape, whatever it is that's holding him out right now. It'll be interesting to see if they can get him back because I know I've seen some people mention he's, you know, they're playing so well with Federico right now. Could he mess up the flow? They're going to need John Hughley to come on and eat up some minutes as a big it's it's not realistic to think that Fetty's going to play 34 minutes a night in ACC play and not get in foul trouble some nights not have some off nights not break down with his frail frail frame so I I think it's very important that they get Hughley back and potentially get Jorge or Nate to eat some of those minutes as well because these guys I mean we're 4-0 in ACC play but they're going to play 20 ACC games we're only a fifth of the way there so that is the one thing right now that I think that's the next step that this team has to take. Get a guy healthy in John Hughley and also find another guy that can eat up some minutes for them. Well, I'm not sure if you heard, Dylan. This is not confirmed, but it is a pretty good source. The source being John Hughley's Instagram Live after the Virginia game. He said he's coming back on Saturday. Whether that means he plays 20 minutes, 10 minutes, 5 minutes, he thinks he's back. And like you said, it's we don't need him to be last year's John Hughley. We don't need him to get 20 rebounds. And maybe I mean, we don't great. even want him to. We might not even want him to be last year's yeah. John Hughley t- getting so many post touches. But I'll tell you what, he would have been useful against UNC, a guy to contain Bake a little bit, a guy who can throw his weight around and take up space down low, give Federico a blow. You got to keep rolling with Federico. I did not think I'd be saying that. That was not on my bingo card. But – Having an extra big man would be big. Um, and if these guards keep doing what they're doing, I think they can carry us. It's a down year for the ACC, so you really got to take advantage of it this year because 
there's some bad teams. Like we play Louisville twice. If we lose to Louisville once, that is pathetic. So it's a it's attainable. And I think this team is so balanced. It can, like you said, Pitt hasn't had depth in previous years, but it was, there wasn't much depth in the starting lineup either. Yeah. Right now you have five options in the starting lineup. And if you look at it, five out of the last six games, there's a different leading scorer. Nelly was a leading scorer. He had 24 against Syracuse, I think. Federico had a 20 point game. I think it was against North Florida. Henson was a leading scorer. Uh, Greg Elliott had a big game. They can all do it on any given night. It's just a matter of enough guys stepping up to the plate, whether it's Burton's night to go off, Henson's night, Nelly. I think they're good enough to keep this team afloat with a maybe depleted blench. Yeah, and I hear you. I have no issues with running those guards out there in rotation. I just worry a, a guy picks up two early fouls. A guy tweaks an ankle and has to sit out a game uh, not to jinx mm-hmm. anyone but i mean these are, that's the realistic thing that will happen in the course of a 20 game conference schedule those issues will come up so i i do really hope that they can bring another guy along i mean and they santos seems like the most realistic option for me because he's he showed that he's played a little bit at this level he's big he's will a willing rebounder um If he can knock down some shots for them, that's really all they need from him offensively. I think just having him in a spot where he he's not a negative on defense can put them in a really good position to where I'm not saying Nate Santos has to play 20 minutes a game, but if he can give us 10, that that would be really big for this pit team. So it's, it's exciting. Uh, This is a very exciting spot to be in. It's awesome to see how much, momentum and how much hype there is around Pitt right now. And it's not just in Pittsburgh. It's national. You're seeing guys like John Rothstein tweeting about Pitt again. Uh, Andy Katz has said it's time to rank Pitt with their back-to-back ranked wins. They have four quad one wins. And there's only, I believe, seven teams in the country who have four of those right now. So Pitt's putting together a resume. There's going to be opportunity here to string together some wins. Uh, Start with a win against Clemson, you're five and zero in ACC play. You got to go on the road to Duke, but then you have Louisville and Georgia Tech after that. So there's a real chance for this team to jump out to the front of the ACC and be in that battle and be in contention for uh, those top spots and definitely a top four spot. I think that's more than realistic at this point, and that should be a real and attainable goal for them. This is pretty cool. Talking it's, about Pitt in January, Pitt basketball in January. <laughs> It's amazing. Like I'm so I'm smiling ear to ear right now because last year we couldn't even muster together the courage to do like a 10 minute segment on the basketball team. No, it it was terrible. But I look ahead to Clemson. They shoot the ball. They shoot a ton of threes and they shoot it at a high clip. Uh, they've got, you know, their top three scores all shoot over 42 percent from three. Hunter Tyson. Chase Hunter, PJ Hall, he's a big, but he will step out and shoot it. They've got Alex Hemingway, who's shooting 50% from three. I mean, they can flat out shoot it. And this is a team that can kind of take the air out of a out of a building. Peterson could be rocking, but you know, you can hit a couple threes in a row, get down, mm-hmm. that could kind of take the air out of things. So it's gonna be big for Pitt to defend the perimeter and make it tough on on these Clemson shooters. Yeah, I'll just be a little bit more consistent the last two games. They've won, but they've had the scratch and claw back in. So you can't get behind a team that can shoot like this. Hopefully we can have the defense locked in early. We don't have to take 20 minutes to adjust to what they're doing on offense or or even on, on defense. Absolutely. Well, I know one thing from being at the last two games, these guys thrive off the energy of pit fans. You can tell when the arena gets into it. That's when they start getting stops. That's when they start – pushing the ball a little bit, getting big buckets and place gets loud. Those players lock in. So pit fans show up and show out on Saturday. Let's support the Panthers. It's the biggest game at the Peterson in six, seven, eight years at this point. So show up and show out. If you can't make it tune in on ESPN too. Um, we're not going to say they're back, but pit basketball is fun again and they're well on their way. So all I can really say is, 
please win. I'm wearing the shirt. Please win. Please win. Just give us one more. And then another. Absolutely. I, well, no, no, no. Please win Saturday. Please win Saturday. We're not getting greedy. One at a time. One at a time. But absolutely. Well, thank you for tuning in. Uh, check out the basketball game on Saturday. And to close us out, just continued thoughts and prayers with Damar Hamlin and his family. Uh, we're pulling for you, Damar. Everyone in the pit community, everyone across the country is. And uh, we know you're going to pull it out because you're a fighter. So uh, with that, we'll be signing off. Hail, loyal sons of Pittsburgh. Cool. This episode of The Loyal Sun Show is brought to you by Rendine Consulting. If you've listened to us for any amount of time, you know all about Rendine Consulting's commitment to the Pitt Athletics program and brand and how much they've meant to the Loyal Suns. That's Rendine Consulting, providing investment managers assistance with technology integration. Visit www.rendineconsulting.com for more information. That's www.rendine.com consulting.com.